Call your next witness, please. Clerk and be sworn. You swear from testimony about the evidence case to be a truthful treatment without a truthful judge? I do. Have a seat. Sign up. Microphone, please. You may proceed. Please introduce yourself to the jury. I'm uh, Stephen Charles Manookin. You don't need to get right on that microphone. All right. I think I saw that. All right. You may want to push it. I, I am loud. Right here. Spell your birth and your last name for us. It's uh, M as in Mary, N as in Nancy, O O K I N. And do you know Brian Winchester? Yes, I do. How many years have you known Brian Winchester? I've known him since about 2004, so 14 years. Were you friends or acquaintances? How would you We were friends. Did Brian Winchester approach you in August of 2016? Yes. What did he approach you about? He um, called me on the morning of August, it was a Friday, I think it was the 5th, and said that he hit a new low and wanted to talk to me did over you, lunch. Did you meet with him for yes, lunch? Yes, I did. And did he describe a what was later charged as a kidnapping of Denise Williams? Yes. And he described that in detail? Yes. And you eventually came forward to law enforcement with that? Correct? Yes. Correct. Did he indicate to you uh, at lunch what was the catalyst for him performing that criminal act, that kidnapping? He said that on the night, um, on Thursday night, the night before, the police came to his house and said that they've been talking to Denise, and once Denise gets, she is going to talk to the police about what really happened to um, Mike Williams. And what did that mean to Brian Winchester? What did he... Well, he, it made him very nervous, and he really wanted to talk to her about it. And he kept calling her, but she wouldn't answer. So he decided that the best way to talk to her would be to kidnap her. When you met at lunch that day... Uh, this was before he was arrested? Correct. And have you seen him outside the courtroom since he was arrested? No. <laughs> so that lunch, Brian Winchester indicated to you that Denise Williams was aware of something going on with the disappearance of Mike Williams? Yes. And that, that prompted him to kidnap her? Yes. So they could discuss it further? Yes. I'll pass the witness. Cross. Dr. Minokin, what police officers came to talk to Mr. Winchester? I don't know. Do you know if, in fact, that actually happened, that police came and talked to him? No, I don't. And you testified that Mr. Winchester's revelation to you was the best way to talk to Denise would be to kidnap her. That's what he said, yes. Did he tell you he kidnapped her at gunpoint? Yep. Nothing further? Nothing Rick, Rick. Nothing good. All right. Any juror have a question of this witness? All right. If not, you may step down. Do we need to keep him further? No, I didn't say it. You need it for any reason, Mr. White. Uh, Your Honor, um, Mr. Fuchs and I have a stipulation as to, but we don't need him. Also. Uh, let's talk about this with your excuse. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for being here. Go ahead. All right. Yeah, Mr. White. Your Honor, the State of Defense has reached a stipulation to the introduction of what has been marked. Defendant's Exhibit 1 is the proper agreement after it was uh, to be introduced through Mr. Jansen, 
who's on both witness lists. We have agreed that we will introduce that exhibit, um, and we can excuse Mr. Jansen. I may, uh, uh, um, the, because uh, I've told you a number of times that what the attorneys say is not evidence. Of course, in all legal things, we have to have exceptions. Uh, there are exceptions when the attorneys agree that facts are uh, a certain way. We encourage attorneys to get together and stipulate the things. That saves your time and my time. Um, and no, it's uncontested. Uh, so when the parties agree that certain facts are true, that is called a stipulation of fact. You must accept stipulated facts as having been proven. However, the significance of these facts, as with all facts, is for you to decide. Uh, in the case of stipulated facts between the parties is that um, Defense Exhibit 1 is the agreement between the state of Florida and Mr. Winchester. Is that the stipulation of the parties? That is correct, Your Honor. That is correct, Your Honor. Right. It will be accepted and admitted as Defense Exhibit 1. All right. Your next witness, Mr. Pugh. Your Honor, I'm David Paul. I'm Your Please, sir. Please, sir. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Can you please introduce yourself to the jury? My name's Howard Drew. And Mr. Drew, uh, do you live in the Tallahassee area? Yes, I do. And how long do you live here? Oh, for the last 30 years. Over that time period, did you know someone by the name of Mike Williams? I did. How did you initially meet Mike Williams? Uh, his mother requested that I talk to him about, he, he was very interested in hunting. So uh, that's, we've met before then, but uh, because she was my daughter's babysitter, so I'd see Mike off and on for quite a while. Okay. Uh, when you say hunting, what kind of hunting were you initially talking to him about? Well, I tried to talk him into deer hunting, but I made the mistake of carrying him duck hunting, and he just went crazy. <laughs> I told him duck hunters wasn't very sane because they always went out in freezing cold weather, you know, and sat in a boat. At least deer hunting, you could sit in a stand. Um, whenever he went crazy over the duck hunting, did um, that cause you any concerns, I guess? Let me back up. We say you're teaching about hunting and things along those lines. Are you also teaching him safety procedures and things along those lines? Yes, sir. Uh, I told Mike before I'd carry him hunting, he had to complete the hunter safety course. And uh, me and his dad, his dad, uh, I can't believe Mike really was interested in hunting because no one in his family that I know of hunts. So, But anyway, his dad uh, rode down each uh, evening. I think we went uh, two nights a week and then had the Saturday uh, training session down at the shooting range. And he completed the course, so I was pretty well locked in then, you know. Yes, sir. You also teach him initially, were you, was he more, or were you trying to teach him duck hunting or, or deer hunting? I was trying to teach him duck hunting, you know, I mean deer hunting, but he was more into duck hunting, so we went to Lake Ammonia one morning, and uh, it was plenty of ducks, which is, uh, I was hoping for just a cold, freezing morning and no ducks, and that might discourage him, but it just turned out the other way, you know, but, uh, I was somewhat concerned with the duck hunting because uh, you, you out on water, I know in uh, deer hunting you can fall out of a tree stand, but uh, I just was a little negative on the on the duck hunting, but he continued on. <laughs> okay. 
Now, as I understand it, duck hunters uh, occasionally wear waders in order to do so. That is true. Okay. And at some point, did Mike inform you that he, had been, he was going to purchase a pair of waders and start doing duck hunting waders? He called me one afternoon and told me to come over and look at his new waders he had. And I said, oh, Mike, I'll be over in a few minutes because to me that was very serious. You know, a many a good man and woman went to the bottom in a pair of waders. Why is that? Well, they fill up, if you fall in the water, the old ones uh, didn't have, they're not the neoprene tight fitting jobs, you know. The old ones were kind of baggy and once you went over and water started getting in and most people panic and beat around and pretty soon you full of water and you go to the bottom and that's it. And you've been asking Miss Cheryl how to teach him how to do this hunting safety, correct? Oh, yes. Uh, see, Cheryl was a big pressure. Uh, it was, I would have rather carried my own child out than her son, you know. But anyway, uh, uh, when Mike told me he had a pair of waders, I rushed right on over. So when I got there, I said, Mike, I said, um, listen, I said, the waders are great. I said, I can see you right now. You can push your boat out and wade out and ease into it and not have to try to push off the shore and all that kind of stuff. But I said, you must remember with waders, there's a couple of things you've got to remember. I said, one is if your boat turns over or you stand up to shoot at a duck and the recoil from the shotgun knocks you backwards, you cannot panic. I said, don't worry about your shotgun. You can go back and look for it later. I said, worry about staying calm, getting a breath of air before you go down. And I said, on the way down or whatever, I said, you'll feel the cold water during the winter time. But I said, just be as calm as you can. Unclip your waders, uh, straps, and get them off. And I said, normally you're not in too deep a water uh, for when you're duck hunting. I said, you can always kick off the bottom, get you another breath of air. And I said, go down and then start working them off. I said, you can even be like a porpoise, kind of flipping with your feet and swimming as hard as you can. I said, because the important thing is to get a breath of air stay calm and work those things off so uh, he said well can we try it i said sure i said i'll do you one better than my daddy did me i said i won't carry you down to the pond we didn't have a swimming pool but i said you got a swimming pool man i said go in and put some a pair of slacks on just like you were going honey in except maybe the coat i said you don't have to put a coat on because the best i remember it was doing the warmer part of the year, July, August, somewhere along in there. And uh, we just had, I started him out in the uh, shallow end of the pool because I really didn't want to have to jump in and try to pull him out. But uh, we worked on it and he was a good student. In fact, I made him at the end of it go up on the diving board and dive off and, and he did everything fine. Uh, I was surprised. He was always an easy learner in anything I, I worked with him. So we did it two or three times. And so as I understand it, you took the, and you're talking about this stuff that's going on in the pool. He's wearing waders at this time. Oh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. He so was, uh, and we probably worked uh, two or three hours there that afternoon. And I went over one other time, and I told him to practice in the shallow end. I said, don't, don't have your mother call me and tell you you're drowned in the deep part of the thing because you hit your head on a diving board or something on the way down. But I said, uh, you know, feel comfortable because practice makes perfect. So to your knowledge, Mike Williams regularly practiced to get out of those waves? I know he did uh, uh, because the one thing Mike was, he was honest. I told him that would soon disappear because hunters and fishermen always had to lie a little bit about how long the fish was, how big the deer was, or how many ducks they killed. But uh, he told me, I called him a couple times. I said, bud, you still practicing? He said, I feel very comfortable with it, Mr. Howard. I said, okay. You mentioned earlier about and a little bit about the steps to take off and popping the, the straps off. Right. The first step would be to take the straps off. Right. And I and then work the bib part of it off, uh, and then you're down to your waist, you know. 
And I always told Mike to, you know, try to work one leg out if it was possible. And then the other leg, I said, but you get one leg out, you can do a lot of swimming, uh, surprisingly. I said, you'll do a lot more than you think you can do uh, when your life's on the line. I know for a no questions, Your Honor. All right. Any jury have a question of this witness? All right. You can step in. Do we need to keep him any further? Sir. No, Your Honor. No, Your Honor. You're excused. Thank you for being here. You're free to go. Call your next witness. All right. That's not We call Lindsay Lockhart. Lindsay Lockhart. Okay. And Ms. Lockhart, I understand that you're, uh, if you could please spell your first and last name for my report. Okay. It's L I N D S A Y L O C K H A R T. Okay. And my understanding is your maiden name is Ketchum? Yes. Um, and you're related to Clay Ketchum and Patty Ketchum and I am. Brett Ketchum? I'm Clay and Patty's daughter and Brett's sister. Um, how long did you, you live in Tallahassee now? I do not. Have you ever lived in Tallahassee? I did. Okay. When did you live in Tallahassee? I lived here um, my whole life from the time I was born until 2011. Okay. And during that time period, did you have an opportunity to know someone by the name of Mike Williams? Absolutely. How did you know Mike Williams? Um, Mike started working for my dad uh, when I was in, I think I was in the sixth grade. Okay. And... Um, did you go up to your dad's business and that's how you knew him? How, how did you actually know him? Yeah, I, I, um, my dad's business is a small family-owned business, so I was up there quite a bit answering phones and um, filing, and then I actually started working for him on and off just throughout my whole childhood and, and adolescence growing up. And even into college, I worked there on and off, so I got to know Mike really well. All in all, how long did you know Mike? <laughs> I knew him um, from the sixth grade until the day I graduated from FSU. Because you knew Mike, did you know Denise? Yes. Um, how did you know Denise? Because she was married to Mike, and like I said, it was a small family business, so we did um, we did things together. Was there a lot of interaction between, I guess, the family business, yourself, Ms., uh, Mr. and Mrs. Will, uh, Williams? Yes. Did you also know Brian Winchester? I did. How did you know Brian Winchester? Because he was best friends with Mike. Um, did y'all ever go out together on occasions and things like that? We did. Um, when I was in college and uh, a little older, we, we w went out a few times. Yeah. Say so going out, what are you talking about? Um, we went to happy hour a few times, and um, we went to a concert together. Um, that concert you're talking about, what concert was that? It was Sister Hazel at Floyd's. And where is, what is Floyd's? It was a bar on Tennessee Street. Okay. Was that over by the Florida State University campus? Yes. Okay. And what is Sister Hazel? A band from Gainesville. Okay. So you went and saw the band Sister Hazel at Floyd's, which is, I guess, part of the Tennessee Strip. Is that right? Correct. Okay. And when was that concert? I believe it was in the fall of 1997. Uh, who all went to that concert? Was it a group of y'all that went, or just you? It was a group of us. Um, it was myself, um, Angela Stafford, Denise. Brian and Mike. What about Kathy Brian? What? She wasn't there. When y'all went out to this concert, um, were y'all having a good time? Yeah. 
I would say so. Did, was there anything that stood out to you as being odd at that concert? Yes. What is that? Um, I remember at one point, myself, Mike, and Angela were at the bar, and I looked over and saw um, Brian and Denise together, and Brian was standing behind Denise with his arms around her waist. And it struck me as very odd because Mike was married to Denise. Did Mike see that? I don't know how he would not have seen it. And what was your reaction? Discomfort. What happened next? I don't, I don't remember specifics about anything happening. I, I do know the next day I told my parents asked me how the concert was. And I said the concert was fine, but if I didn't know any better, I would have thought Brian was married to Denise and not Mike. Mike was there with you, obviously. Mm -hmm. Was Mike a drinker on a normal one? Not typically, but he was that night. He, that night he drank more than normal? More than I had seen him drink in the past, and he was concerned that I would tell my dad that he was drinking that much. The interaction, you said that you saw Brian standing behind Denise with his arms around her. Mm -hmm. um, did that... Obviously, you had, I assume you've been in relations with people before. Mm -hmm. You've had friends that are in relations. It would help this lady if he would say yes or no. Or, uh, 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 okay. Oh, I'm sorry. She's trying to okay. take down what you say. You've had friends that are in relations with people. Yes. Dating type of relations. Yes. And you've had friends that are in friendly type of relations. Yes. You've seen them interact over those time periods. Yes. The way in which Miss Denise Williams and Mike w and Brian Winchester were on that evening when you saw them in that situation, how would you categorize that? It was, uh, it seemed like a new love, like a boyfriend-girlfriend type um, position they were in. A familiarity, if you will? Yes. Familiar with each other? Very. More than friends? Very much so. Yeah. Do you see Miss Denise Williams here in court today? I do. Can you please point to her and indicate an article of clothing she's wearing? Um, a gray sweater. And that is the person you saw in that situation with Ryan Winchester, correct? It is. No further questions. Cross. Miss Lockhart, this concert was 21 years ago? Yes. And you remember you were standing at the bar in Floyd's Music Store with Mike Williams uh, and Angela Stafford? Correct. And you looked out across the dance floor and you saw Brian Winchester standing suggestively behind Denise Williams? I wouldn't say it was across the dance floor. How far away was it? <clears throat> Ten feet. Okay, how long did it take for Mike to get over there and punch Brian in the face? It didn't happen. Or, well, how long did it take for Mike to get over there and confront Brian about it? dancing with his wife or hugging on his wife. It didn't happen. What do you mean it didn't happen? Mike never didn't do anything? No, sir. Well, did Mike say anything after he left the bar and left you guys behind? Not to me. How did you leave Floyd's music store? I don't recall. How did you get there? I don't recall. Because you don't know if you were in a car together with these individuals and then left together? I believe Angela and I rode together. But the next day, when you went into work, Mike was there? I believe the next day was a Sunday. Do you know when you went in on Monday, was Mike there? I'm not even sure if I was still working at Ketchum at the time. When, after you saw this event that is clear in your mind today, when was mm -hmm. the next time you talked with Mike Williams about it? I never talked with him about it. Nothing else, Your Honor. Ms. Lockhart, was uh, Mike a person, a private person? Absolutely. Very. Um, not one that would normally talk about personal matters with you? Correct. So it's not odd that you didn't 
that he didn't discuss this with you, correct? No. Um, walk over and punch Brian in the face. Is that typical of what Mike would do? Not at all. You mentioned the drinking. Um, he's not a heavy drinker, but on that evening, he drank a lot more than normal, correct? Correct. Because of what he saw? I assume. That's a good point. Hey, Jerry, I have a question for this witness. All right, you can step down. Do we need to keep her any further? No, Your Honor. Actually, she should be retained. She can go about her business, but... Uh, okay, you'll be on call. Remain under the rule of sequestration. Call your next witness. Yes, Your Honor. This time, stay with Paul Andrews. Mm -hmm. Y'all doing okay? You need a, need a break. We'll get another witness in. We're good? All right. If at any point you need a break, just raise your hand. You need a break. All right, let's take a break. We'll take 15 minutes. Either side need anything? There you are. There you are. All right. Fifteen minutes. Okay. They can't get through uh, in ten minutes. Right. 